Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to History Happened Here, which is a part of the Robert W. Reeder the First speaker series here in the history program at YSU. Uh, my name is Dr. Fluker, and I am currently serving as the Reader Professor, and so it's my pleasure to bring you this speaker series, um, which we've been running over the course of this year. Um, history Happened Here is um, intended to explore subjects in local and regional history, highlighting the contributions of Ohio and Ohioans at important moments in national and even world history. So that's why I am so pleased to welcome Melissa Carmen this afternoon, who is the director of the Sutliff Museum in Warren, Ohio. And she also serves as the region four representative of the Ohio Local History Alliance. Um, and another point of pride, she is an alum from our program here at YSU. Um, so thank you so much for being with us, Melissa. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you're um, going to share with us about the Sutliff family. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Fluker for having me today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right. All right, this program is a part of our series, Who Were the Sutlifts and Why, she, why Should You Care? Um, we've done a little bit about the family and uh, lately it's been, Come, it's come to my attention that people have been wondering why the set lists are so important. So this is uh, what I have for you today. Um, the Sutla family and the Underground Railroad. So like, like Dr. Fluker said, my name is Melissa Carmen and I've been the director of the Sutla Museum since uh, 20, I've been with the Sutla Museum since 2013. And I've learned a lot about the family and the Underground Railroad during my time as the museum's archivist, curator, and currently the, the director. It wasn't until we applied to join the Network to Freedom program through the National Park Service that I really understood how far the Sutliff family's influence reached in the anti-slavery movement. Today I will share with you some of the stories that were found and some of the objects from the museum's collection that support the family's work with the Underground Railroad and the anti-slavery movement. The Sutliff family risked fines and imprisonment to help those escaping slavery. Ohio was a free state, but its government supported the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, which forcibly compelled citizens to assist in the capture of runaway slaves. People, there were plenty of people in Trumbull County that knew that this was a bad law and stood up for freedom. The Sutliff family were among those people. Levi and his brothers came to Trumbull County from New England along with many others. They brought with them a strong religious conviction against slavery. The American line, Sutliff line, as far as it can be traced, begins in West Yorkshire, England in the early 1500s under the rule of King Henry VIII. Uh, the first Sutliffs appear in the Americas around 1661 in Massachusetts. And the first Sutliff men helped to establish new, new settlements. Some were elected officials and many were soldiers. We see here Samuel Sutliff's papers as an ensign in the Sixth Company of Militia for the state of Connecticut. His payment for being a soldier was given as land in Litchfield, New York. Shortly after receiving his lands in New York, Samuel purchased, purchased 128 acres of land from the Connecticut Land Company at $3 per acre for a total of $384. He traveled with his wife, Ruth, and sons, Alan Curtis, Samuel Harvey, uh, to Trumbull County, Vernon Township. And following their settlement, Samuel and Ruth added four more sons to the family, Levi, Milton, Calvin Granger, and Flavel. After settling in Trumbull County, the Sutliff family began to get involved in the community and became an influential family in the area. The Sutliff sons were educated by their mother and by going away to school. We know that Milton's schooling was supported by his brother Alan's work. 
Alan Curtis, pictured here with his wife, Nancy, was the eldest son, and he helped out on the family's farm until well after he was married. Around 1838, he and his family relocated to Iowa, where Alan became a notable man within Johnson County, Iowa. Alan and his family settled their large farm on the northeastern part of Johnson County, Iowa, along the Cedar River. In 1840, Alan built a ferry boat and established a ferry service for the benefit of himself and his neighbors to bring goods across the Cedar River and down the Mississippi River. By the late 1840s, Alan brought machines to help farmers of Iowa to plant and harvest their crops. As he came from a family that really disliked the notion of slavery, he it may be assumed that his very service could have been used to help freedom seekers, though we have found no evidence yet. Today, there is this bridge that spans the Cedar River uh, where Alan has had his business. And it is open today that you can walk across it. Levi Sutliff's anti-slavery work began early in his adult years. During a business trip to the South, Levi and his brother Calvin stopped at a hotel in Kentucky. Dinner at the hotel was served by slaves. A child served tea to a nearby a table near the Sutliff brothers. The mistress knocked the teacup over and it spilled on the child burning her arm. The woman was angry at what had occurred took up a cowhide and started whipping the child. Levi, having never seen a slave whip before, stepped in say, um, to, and took the whip from the woman to prevent further harm from the child. The woman's husband came at Levi with a knife and the landlord of the hotel stepped in saying, gentlemen, please be seated. We will settle this after dinner. Now, Levi wanted to settle the matter right away and the landlord gave him his word that there would not be another slave whip there. Following the dinner, the Sutliff brothers went to pay for their bill and they said that they would not stay and witness such cruelty. The landlord said it would ruin his business if they left as he had not been open long and that such the, and another situation like that would not be repeated. The Sutliffs did stay three weeks and they never did see another punished slave. The Sutliff family was not the only abolition, abolitionist family in Trumbull County. Andrew Bushnell and Ralph Plum were highly involved in the Underground Railroad as well. Hartford and Vernon Townships were two neighboring communities in Trumbull County that were famous for underground railroad stations. General Bushnell's home was closely watched by slave catchers at times. One instance when there were two freedom seekers of great importance that needed to be transferred to the next station, General Bushnell's daughter, Mary, who was 14 years old at the time, and Ralph's sister, Mary Plum, who was 15, took the freedom seekers to the next station. The story goes that Mary Bushnell in a sunbonnet and a shawl roll, rode on a load of hay hiding the freedom seekers from her fa father's house through Hartford Center to the Sutliff home in Vernon Township. At midnight, Mary Bushnell and Mary Plum drove northward to Ashtabula with the hay covered wagon to the home of Henry Harris where they safely delivered the fleeing men. Levi Sutliff admired Mary Plum so much that he married her on September 17, 1834. Mary continued her abolitionist work by founding the Female Anti-Slavery Society of Vernon, along with Levi's mother, Ruth, serving as the organization's secretary. And we see on here, Mary Ruth, or Ruth Sutliff's signature and Mary Plum signature. Sadly, Mary Plum died in March of 1836 of unknown causes. 
Levi Sutliff's abolitionist work included being a founding member of the National Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. A convention was assembled in the city of Philadelphia to formally organize and create their declaration, which called for the immediate and uncompensated emancipation of all enslaved persons and to denounce the use of violent resistance. Delegates from 10 states are listed at the bottom of the declaration with Levi and Milton Sutliff as delegates from Ohio. On October 1st, 1840, Levi Sutliff married Phoebe Lord Marvin. They lived on a 600 acre farm in Johnson Township. That, that house along with Levi's father, Levi's father Samuel's house were stations on the Underground Railroad. According to Phoebe Sutliff, the hiding place in their Johnston farmhouse was on the second floor with a low roof. It was, it made it easier for the freedom seeker to jump to the ground and run toward the cornfield, which was near the house. When a freedom seeker was hiding in the house, someone was always on the watch for slave catchers. If one should come to their house, Levi would keep them into in his office until he thought the person escaped safely to the next safe house. Samuel's home was used as a meeting place for the local anti-slavery society meetings. And there was also a hiding place in that house. Samuel had a casing built around the chimney in the attic with a sliding door where the freedom seeker would be able to quickly hide when slave catchers were nearby. In the 1840s, Levi Sutliff went to Wheeling, West Virginia to visit James Brown. He was taken by Brown to a place where a freedom seeker was hidden. This man had, a he had this heavy wrought iron shackle bolted around his ankle. Previously, he attempted to escape his owner in Virginia. After being captured and returned to his owner, the slave was beaten and then taken to a blacksmith who created this hobble from an iron bar and bolted it around his ankle with the prongs forming a tail in the back. As a result of this design, the hobble would leave a trail so the slave could always be followed and could not successfully escape again, but he did. He found a piece of clothesline, turned the hobble around his ankle so the prongs were in the front, tied a rope around the tail, looped it around his neck and shoulders. This allowed the weight of the hobble to be distributed onto his shoulders and back, as well as eliminating the trail from the prongs. The freedom seeker made his way from Loudoun County, Virginia to Wheeling, West Virginia, where he met an agent of the Underground Railroad. As soon as Levi saw this man, he took him to a local blacksmith to saw off the bolts and pry open the prongs to get the shackle off. The man's flesh on his ankle had been worn nearly to the bone. Once removed, Levi and James Brown forwarded the man to Salem and Levi brought the hobble home to Warren where Mrs. Phoebe Sutliff saved the hobble and wrote the story on two note cards and pasted them to the hobble. And you can still see it in the museum. An incident in January of 1857, published by H.U. Johnson in his March 1887, Issue of Lakeshore Home Magazine chronicles the story of five freedom seekers from Loudoun County, Virginia. Of the five were brothers Charles and Henry Washington, Billy Lee, James Webb, and John Jackson. After traveling on their own for more than a week, the runaways reached Pittsburgh, where Underground Railroad operatives took charge and shipped them by train in a boxcar to Salem, and then they arrived in Warren on New Year's Day. The men were taken openly to Chapman House and served a royal breakfast. Judge Milton Sutliff joined and welcomed the group and gave each of the men a dollar. Levi and other abolitionists of Warren held a council about how best to help the five freedom seekers and keep them safe. It was decided in this council that it was safer for the men 
to remain in or close to Warren rather than attempt to reach Canada in the dead of winter. The men were given employment and housing until some of them decided to move on. At the time this article was printed, Charles Washington was still living in Warren as a blacksmith with his family. And today there is a memorial gravestone uh, to Charles Washington located in the Oakwood Cemetery. Milton Sutliff was educated in the schools thanks to the extra support of his eldest brother, Alan. Early on, Milton was employed as a teacher in Ohio and in Mississippi, where he came in contact with slavery and saw the horrors of the institution. He returned to Ohio and entered Western Reserve College in 1830. During his studies, he took a strong stance against slavery and played a large part in the debates that were happening on the campus. Milton graduated in 1833 and then accompanied his brother Levi to Philadelphia for the founding of the National Anti-Slavery Society. He was elected to the Ohio Senate in 1849 as a member of the Free Soil Party and was instrumental in getting Benjamin F. Wade sent to the U.S. Senate. Milton served one year in one term in the Senate and in the 1857 election, he won a position on the Ohio Supreme Court and took his seat in 1858. He served five years and the last of which he served as Chief, Chief Justice. All throughout his political career, he, his arguments were against the fugitive slave law and for the abolition of slavery. One of his most famous cases involves a suit of habeas corpus filed by two men involved in the Oberlin Wellington rescue in 1859. Simon Bushnell and Charles Lang Langston believed that the federal government did not have the authority to arrest or try them because the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was un unconstitutional. The Ohio Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the law and by a three, by a three to two ruling and Milton was one of the two. Flavel Sutliff also contributed to the anti-slavery movement. Throughout his law career, Flavel saw the work that his older brothers, Levi and Milton, were doing. Flavel had a law practice in Ashtabula, partnering with Joshua Giddings, who would go on to become an influential man in Ohio and serve in the o U.S. House of Representatives, all the while opposing slavery. Among the letters in the Sutliff Museum's collection, we found this letter from the Ashtabula Anti-Slavery Society naming Flavel to represent Ashtabula at the Ohio Anti-Slavery Society Convention in Muskingum County in 1839. Also through, throughout the letters, we found a bond that was created between Milton and Flavel. And this bond was split in half between abolitionist messages and the importance of education and gentlemanly behavior. This bond allowed for an open discussion of abolitionist speaking between the brothers. Milton's molding of Flavel's behavior during the abolitionist movement produced a reliance upon each other with Milton trusting Flavel, who was sometimes seen as aloof with important information of the abolitionist movement. Milton turned to Flavel to help a freedom seeker, even though he knew his brother Levi's involvement with the Underground Railroad. He asked Flavel to find this person work on his land with the understanding that the man's background was to be completely ignored. The freedom seeker was from Virginia, but his father was an Englishman. Milton knew that helping this man could cause issues for anyone who helped, but he trusted that his brother would carry out his wishes without any concern. When Milton decided in 1842 
and that as a political abolitionist, he needed to switch to the Liberty Party. He asked Flavel to consider making a change to his political beliefs as well. Um, he did not want to sway Flavel's decision, but asked that he be told about his position before it was announced publicly. Milton believed that the question was one of most weighty importance. He also offered Flavel books to help him determine the proper position. <clears throat> the anti-slavery works of brothers Samuel Harvey and Calvin Granger are unknown at this time, and we may never really know what they are. What we do know is that Samuel Harvey was an educator. He traveled to Mississippi and then to Iowa to live, live near his brother, Alan Curtis. He died at the age of 40 in Iowa and is buried in the Sutliff Cemetery. Calvin Granger practiced law, the same as his older brothers. He died at the age of 44, leaving his wife and young children to the care of his brother, Milton. All of this and more is why the Sutliff Museum exists. Levi's daughter, Phoebe Temperance Sutliff, was very proud of her family's work in the abolitionist movement. As the last living member of this line, Phoebe left her house and resources to the Warren Library Association for the purpose of creating a museum in her family's memory. She wanted to give future generations a glimpse of Victorian life and to recognize her family's work with the anti-slavery movement. We still have a lot more transcribing and research to complete. And hopefully as we delve more into the documents we have in our collection, we will be able to learn more about the Sutla family's role and their work during the anti-slavery movement. Thank you. You're still muted. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> that was fascinating. Let me, uh, there, now I can see you again. Um, okay. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you just a couple of questions. And I don't know if any of our participants have questions for you as well, but um, a couple easy ones. Uh, where is the Sutliff Cemetery? Uh, the one that I talked about, it's in um, Johnson County, Iowa. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Those were photo, uh, the, the one tall uh -huh. gravestone. Uh, my family and I, we did a trip out west, and as we came back east, we stopped in Sutliff, Iowa, and saw where Alan Cur Curtis settled. We saw the bridge. We walked on the bridge. <laughs> Wonderful. That's cool. Yes. Yes. Are there um, Sutliffs interred in Warren? There are. Um, Flavel is buried in the Pioneer Cemetery in Vernon Township, and then most of the other settlers are in Oakwood Cemetery in Warren. Okay. Yeah, I was interested in that, um, that monument to Charles Washington too, I'll have to check that out. Um, I was also wondering what, um, what happened to their home and um, if there's any surviving images or drawings um, of it. Yeah, I didn't talk about their home in Warren because we don't have a whole lot of information about when they moved to Warren and the work that they did other than um, Levi going to meet the five from Virginia. Um, but yes, we do have photographs of their home. Oh, cool. Um, and that's something that is up on our website as well. Um, it was just a farmhouse and it was located next to St. Mary's Church today, um, over on High Street. Uh, it's no longer standing. It was demolished between um, 1956 and 1960. Um, but we're lucky to have the photographs that we do. Yeah, I definitely will look at that. And I'll put a link uh, 
in the video notes for um, anybody who wants to find the Settlers Museum's website. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, so the story of the hobble was fascinating and we can mm -hmm. see behind you some of your three-dimensional collections. Um, yeah. I wondered if you could say more about your archival collections and if you have a, a favorite collection or a favorite sort of piece um, that's a part of that. Um, we have over 800 letters and documents that were sent and written by the Sutliff, sent to and written by the Sutliff family um, that we are still transcribing. The ones that we do have um, scanned, transcribed, they're all available on our digital collection. Um, my favorite item, <laughs> that's hard. Put you on the spot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and it, it's funny because I, I do have a favorite, but I can't think of it right now because everything has been in storage. Yeah. So. Um, your um, digital collection, so that's accessible through your website as well? Just the archives, yes. Okay, wonderful. That sounds I'll like have to make for my students yeah. to check out. Yes, I'll have to make sure that the link is active on the website though. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other <laughs> thoughts or questions for Melissa? That's my mom, so she's not gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> put her on the spot yeah well um but I guess oh, I was just sorry. thinking I I noticed in the photo um behind me uh there is a quilt and it's over here um this was on display at the state house we had a small um exhibit down at the Ohio State House and that is was actually a banner for the election, who were the candidates? Oh, Logan and Blaine. Okay. So Mrs. Sutliff took that banner and made it into a quilt. And it's it looks like it's red, brown, and white. The brown pieces, like the lettering and any of the blocks that are brown, they used to be blue. Oh, wow. Yes, so it's faded quite a bit, but it's still a really, really cool piece. Well, it's just fascinating to hear about these people, especially to hear about their involvement with the Free Soil Party, which when I teach, I tend to kind of, um, you know, teach them as sort of less committed abolitionists, but it sounds like the Sutliffs were people who were very much anti-slavery, but were diehard abolitionists and really believed in equality for um, former slaves and freedom seekers. So it's such a cool, um, add such a cool level of nuance to these, you know, big, bigger picture themes in American history. Yes. <laughs> so it gives I appreciate it. learning about the Sutliffs. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It gives a, a, a local uh, connection to a bigger event Absolutely. in history. Well, I guess it just remains to thank you um, again for your time and for um, doing this virtual talk for us. And so I'll give you a virtual round of thank applause you. and uh, <laughs> we will hope to have you back again soon. All right. Thank you for having me.